Ahead on Newswatch, Hillary Clinton under fire once again, fueled by new revelations about the Clinton Foundation. See what an investigation now reveals. Plus, invasion of the superbugs. It is scarier than science fiction because this nightmare scenario is all too real. And greater. See what makes this Christian football story so different from all the others. And thank you for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. All hands on deck, the Clinton campaign in full damage control this week, pushing back now after a new report from the Associated Press reveals some big things. It turns out more than half of the non-government people who met with Hillary Clinton while she was Secretary of State were major donors to the Clinton Foundation. Caitlin Burke has more on this fallout. Growing calls today for the Clinton Foundation to close its doors. Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump among those leading the attacks, calling the foundation a vast pay for play scheme. An AP report based on Clinton's calendar and schedule concluded that more than half of the people outside of government who met with her when she was secretary of state had given money to her foundation. Trump is calling for a special prosecutor to investigate, but the Clinton camp calls the AP report, quote, utterly flawed data, both Hillary and Bill Clinton defending their foundation. My work as Secretary of State was not influenced by any outside forces. I made policy decisions based on what I thought was right. We're trying to do good things. If there's something wrong with creating jobs and saving lives, I don't know what it is. AP responded to the Clinton criticism of its report, saying, quote, This reporting was done by the same AP investigative team that discovered Mrs. Clinton's private email server and traced it to her basement in Chappaqua, New York, and whose reporting last week resulted in the resignation of Donald Trump's top campaign strategist. Although Clinton still leads in the polls, the issue could be hurting her with voters already, and Trump is likely to continue to use it against her in the weeks ahead, and quite possibly in the presidential debates as well. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. A miracle in Indiana last night. A tornado's touchdown in the central part of the state, tearing roofs off buildings and even flattening a Starbucks coffee shop, but no one was seriously hurt. Authorities say an EF3 tornado had winds of 165 miles an hour when it struck the town of Kokomo. Indiana Governor Mike Pence is touring the damaged areas today. The death toll from Italy's earthquake is climbing. Some reports indicating about 250 people are now known to be dead. The town of Amatrice was, was a tourist attraction full of bed and breakfast where up to 400 people are still unaccounted for. Guy Sadi from Italy for Christ told CBN News they've organized thousands of beds and items for the people, but he's also asking for prayer. The area that was hit by the earthquake is made of those picturesque and beautiful little towns that everybody sees in the travel, travel books, you know, when you go to Tuscany or Umbria. And so, you know, towns of maybe, uh, uh, you know, 700, 1,000 people. And the one that was really hit bad was Amatrice. And Amatrice is basically a town of less than 2,000 people. And uh, the mayor just, you know, in tears exploded and said, I have no town anymore. That's due to the fact that uh, you're talking about buildings that have been there for centuries and um, so never hit by earthquake or anything like that. So very old. They were not uh, built with the, uh, you know, the structure and the regulations that we have today in Italy for the earthquakes. And so the whole thing just collapsed down. Just pray that. People will just embrace the challenge of, uh, of not giving up right now and, uh, and see what's beyond the earthquake. And you can find a link for Italy for Christ and find out more of what they're doing at our website at CBNnews.com. And CBN Disaster Relief is mounting an operation to help Italy as well. At least 12 people are dead after an attack at an American university in Kabul, Afghanistan. The attackers detonated a suicide car bomb at the university's entrance and gunmen stormed the school. Police killed two of those gunmen eight and a half hours after the attack began. Officials say seven students, three police officers and two security guards are among the dead. You can log on to CBNnews.com for updates on this story. 
throughout the entire day. A U.S. Navy warship was harassed by four smaller Iranian boats today. The Iranian boats ignored warnings as they raced toward the guided missile destroyer USS Nitze. It happened in international waters at the Strait of Hormuz. That is the mouth of the Persian Gulf, an area where Iran has threatened U.S. Navy vessels before. In another incident in January, Iran held 10 U.S. Navy sailors hostage. The Obama administration is hoping to re-enlist Russia as a partner in Syria. Secretary of State John Kerry will meet with Russian Foreign Minister this week in a bid to ensure better cooperation and ultimately a resumption in t- talks on a political transaction. The U.S. Wants, wants Russia to pressure Syria to stop its attacks on moderate opposition forces and to focus on ISIS. The U.S. is also concerned about Turkish ground troops in Syria. Turkey is trying to limit the advances of Kurdish Syrian forces, fearing their link to Kurdish rebels in southeastern Turkey. With a vote earlier this month, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America has become the latest American church body to join the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against Israel. But other Christians are fighting back against BDS. As Julie Stahl reports, that's why 100 Christian leaders and Israeli Knesset members are now working together. Serving in the IDF is not the only way of being a soldier for Israel. Israel's safety and well-being are the responsibility of every Jew, of every Christian who loves Israel in every place and at every moment of life. Joseph Sabag of the Israel Allies Foundation is spearheading the effort to push for legislation in the United States to fight the BDS movement against Israel. In May of 2015, South Carolina became the first state in America to adopt modern legislation regulating against the problem of commercial discrimination and boycotts against Israel. Since then, a dozen additional states have also taken action. The BDS movement focuses its campaign on Israeli companies operating in the West Bank, which encompasses biblical Judea and Samaria. Ironically, this affects Palestinians greatly because when Israeli companies move, Palestinians lose good-paying jobs. Critics say the BDS movement isn't about justice or helping the Palestinians. The danger of BDS is that uh, Israel will lose its legitimacy to defend itself and ultimately lose its legitimacy to exist as a Jewish and sovereign state. Our enemies understand this very well. What is going on with BDS as a global name for all the Israel haters is really the misinformation campaign that they're feeding to the general public and the miseducation that's going on on the campuses. Barry Shaw, author of BDS for Idiots, said it's simple. The reason they're protesting only against the Jewish state and not the Arab states and regimes that abuse the Palestinians they profess to help is simply because Israel is the Jewish state. That's no more or no less than blatant anti-Semitism. Shaw says if these BDSers were honest, their boycotts would include Israeli technology, like the Israeli components in their own computers, laptops, and cell phones. But they need these to communicate their lies and the false narratives to their supporters and to the general public. Knesset member and former diplomat Michael Oren sees only one way to combat lies. We beat terror through a combination of, uh, of steadfastness and very good intelligence. We beat terror. Um, but there's only one true uh, defense uh, and one effective weapon against delegitimization, and that is the truth. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Death tourism is on the rise in Belgium. Belgium was the first country to legalize euthanasia, and now suicidal and sick people from around the world are flocking there. Belgium provides assisted suicide for visitors, and it is often free because it is covered by the European Union's health insurance program. The International Business Times reports many of those seeking assisted suicide are from France, and their bills are sent to French health care providers. The patients are killed with a lethal injection administered by a doctor. Even children are allowed to choose euthanasia in Belgium. Last year, more than 2,000 people were euthanized in Belgium. That number for assisted suicide is twice what it was just five years ago. 
In a move called Operation Safari, zoo animals, including a tiger, were transferred from the Gaza Strip to Israel. It was a coordinated effort between the Israeli government and Palestinians. Special cages, veterinary equipment and medicines were brought into the Gaza Strip to facilitate care of the animals before the actual transfer. Five monkeys, two ostriches and two gazelles were just transferred out. They were the last animals left in Khan Yuniz Zoo in southern Gaza. Operation of the zoo had become difficult in recent years. An organization called Poor Four Paws called it the worst zoo in the world. So they helped to initiate the move to save those animals. They're now being transferred to zoos in South Africa, Jordan, and Israel. Coming up, deadly threat on the horizon. Find out how humans are accidentally helping to create a devastating superbug and what you can do to protect yourself. A new study from the University of California at Berkeley has found the consumption of sodas and other sugary drinks fell by 21 percent in low-income neighborhoods in Berkeley after voters in the city passed a tax on them in November of 2014. The measure imposed a tax of one cent per ounce. The study indicates the tax was the reason people consumed less of the drinks, but admitted there could have been other reasons like growing awareness of the problems tied to sugary drinks and the American Beverage Association questioned the study. Still, the report could give more ammunition to people who are trying to pass similar taxes in, in other cities. Well, it sounds like science fiction, a deadly infection strikes, and those antibiotics we've depended on for years simply don't work anymore. As Lori Johnson reports, this nightmare scenario could be all too real. Imagine a child dying from a simple scrape that becomes infected. Sound far-fetched? This spring, a Pennsylvania woman nearly died from a urinary tract infection, something 8 million Americans get every year, but hers was caused by a new, dreaded, drug-resistant bacteria. Antibiotic resistance is one of the most serious health threats we face today. We risk entering a post-antibiotic era, where even simple infections can be deadly. Former FDA Commissioner Peter Pitts agrees. Shame on us if we wait for there to be bodies in the street before we step up to the plate and really begin to address this situation. For the last 70 years, antibiotics have done a great job killing our worst bacterial infections, like E. coli, staph, even the plague. But now we're seeing stronger, more resilient strains of bacteria that antibiotics cannot kill. They're called superbugs. An alarming CDC report reveals these drug-resistant superbugs infect around 2 million Americans each year, killing 23,000. Pitts says bacteria build resistance to antibiotics because doctors overprescribe them. Antibiotics only work against bacterial infections. The vast majority of patients seen by doctors have viral infections, a major difference in the medical world. Still, patients often push for a cure, and doctors usually prescribe an antibiotic, even though it isn't often necessary. And when a patient comes in, or you know, a, a mother or a dad brings in a child with an earache, and the child is crying and screaming, and the parent wants a prescription, and they know that antibiotics just broadly might be a value. Doctor thinks to herself, you know, I, I know that an antibiotic is not going to help this child, but it will give the parent what they want and it's not going to do any harm. And the fact is it does tremendous harm. Another reason for this liberal prescription policy is because it can take too long to determine the type of infection. So right now, unfortunately, the diagnostics still require a day or two or three you know, to properly understand if it is, in fact, a, a bacteria that can be treated with an antibiotic. So a lot of doctors will say, well, prophylactically, I'm going to give you an antibiotic. People with superbugs often receive what's known as antibiotics of last resort, which carry devastating side effects. Where not only are you uh, nauseous all the time, uh, but you really can't function. You're in, you're in bed. You're completely weak. You know, it's like having the worst flu you've ever had for a very long time hoping that it works. Because a lot of times people who develop these antibiotic 
uh, resistant bacteria don't get treated one time. Doctors have to continually experiment with more and more potent antibiotics as a cocktail to find out what works. These antibiotics severely disrupt the immune system, making the patient vulnerable to future infections. So if you allow kind of more mild antibiotics to become ineffective, and even those impact gut flora, and you move into more potent antibiotics, it's going to impact it even more, and that's worse. Doctors wouldn't have to use drugs of last resort if pharmaceutical companies would develop new antibiotics to fight superbugs. But there's very little incentive for them to do so. Developing these antibiotics take years, takes hundreds of millions of dollars, and many of them fail. To make things worse, superbugs are often contracted where you think you'd be most protected, hospitals. People going into hospitals for an appendectomy for a relatively minor operation, otherwise completely healthy, and walking out with a very tough bacteria, hospital-acquired infection that requires extremely potent antibiotics with very nasty side effects, and sometimes they get cured and sometimes they don't. You can help your chances by choosing a hospital with a low infection rate, making everyone who enters your room wash their hands, and asking your doctor to take out medical devices, such as catheters, as soon as possible. Even if you're not planning a hospital visit, there are still lots of things you can do to avoid catching a superbug. That list includes clean hands, proper sleep, less stress, avoiding processed foods. Also, make your body healthier and stronger by getting key vitamins, probiotics, and prebiotics through food, supplements, or both. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Up next, he was the greatest walk-on in college football history. We'll meet one of the actors and hear the amazing true story behind the new film, Greater. An unforgettable story of triumph over tragedy hits theaters tomorrow. It's based on the real life of a young man who beat incredible odds to play college football and earn his bachelor's degree and master's degree at the very same time. Today, his foundation helps other kids to reach their goals. I had the chance to sit down with one of the actors who's bringing this story to the big screen. Old game footage and old photographs are a sweet reminder of the incredible story of Brandon Burlesworth, the Arkansas Razorback who joined the team as a walk-on and became an All-American. Remember, you can't just trust. You have to obey, too. You can do things. Brandon's faith story is now a film called Greater, inspired by the book written about his life. It was a passion project, you know, for everyone who was involved. Neil McDonough plays Brandon's big brother and father figure, Marty. How familiar were you with Brandon's story? Um, I wasn't completely familiar with it, but, you know, I knew of the story. And we're sitting in traffic, my wife, Reve, and I. Uh, and she says, honey, get an email on this, this film about Brandon Burlesworth. I'm like, Brandon Burlesworth, the football player? Yeah, yeah. And uh, she goes, there's, there's a script here with it. I'm like, well, we're stuck in traffic on the 10 freeway in Los Angeles. I'm like, start reading. <laughs> and by page three, I was, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're already bawling by page three. I'm sorry. Just not big enough. Thank you, coach. Come on, let's go. Ran. I can get bigger. You want to walk on? Pay your own way? We certainly won't stop you. You can always use a warm body on the scout team to hold blocking dummies. And if it'll make you feel any better, I'll even make you an invited walk-on. But I want to make one thing absolutely clear. There ain't no way you're ever going to play. Not here. Brandon was exactly, you know, as the film depicts him, just a, a saint of a man that um, had literally nothing going for him as a kid uh, and became, you know, not just the greatest walk-on in, in college history, but one of the greatest athletes in college history. Brandon also died in an accident, headed home to go to church with his mom, 11 days after being drafted to play for the Indianapolis Colts. What's Marty's struggle in this story? That journey and the struggle of why does God take someone so great away from us at the worst of times, 
and to have to deal with that and you know man up and be strong enough for everyone that's a that's a that's a difficult job to do this is a different role for the actor famous for his work in shows like arrow and films like red and band of brothers do you give much thought to your faith when choosing your roles yeah, absolutely yeah um and I've gotten in trouble for it, for that at times. And mm -hmm. people say, well, you'd, you'd be such a huge star if you just have those scenes with women and mm -hmm. sex scenes and such. There's a reason to why I play so many villains. <laughs> when you do a bed scene, you're actually in the bed. If you're you know, having you know, love scenes, you're, you, this is actually, it's physical. Yeah. And I'm just not comfortable with that. When it comes to you know, doing intimate roles in films, I won't do it because you know, I love my wife so much and I love, and, and, I feel that it's, I don't think that's what God wanted me to do. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Vancouver, British Columbia. McDonough has lost roles for that stand, but it's a stand he says he will continue to take. And there is a foundation, by the way, for Brandon Burlesworth as well. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Time now for your Thursday thankful, and here's a prayer of gratitude we can share and express to our Heavenly Father together. Lord, thank you for your perfect timing. We don't always understand why we are waiting on a promise to be fulfilled, but we rest knowing you will never leave us wanting for anything we need. With that prayer, be sure to make this Thursday a thankful one. And that is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do it on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us again right here next time. Make it a thankful Thursday. We'll see you tomorrow.